Hello and welcome to our service coming from St Rollock's Church of Scotland and Site Hill, Glasgow. And it's great to join with you wherever you may be, whether you're part of our congregation at home in some part of Glasgow, whether you're deciding to tune in from another part of the country or even of the world. We are really pleased to be sharing in this time of worship with you. And we pray that as we do worship together, we would have that sense of God being in our midst and his Holy Spirit working amongst us. So as we begin this time of worship together, let me invite you to join with me as we pray together. Lord God, as we come to you this day in prayer, we are thankful that you are the God who knows us perfectly. We thank you that you're the creator God and that you bless us with being able to see the beauty of the changing of the seasons. We thank you for all the new life we see in nature at the moment. Spring flowers pushing through, blossom giving way to new leaves on the trees and even the sunshine breaking through the clouds. What a beautiful world you've made for us and we thank you for that today. We thank you for the many ways that you make yourself known to us not only through nature, but especially through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came alongside those in need, who befriended those whom others had rejected, who valued those whom others overlooked. And we thank you for his presence in our own lives and his promise to be with us always. We thank you too for the sacrificial way that he laid down his life in order that our sins could be forgiven and we could live in peace with you, God, our Heavenly Father. Thank you for understanding us so well, that you know that even when we seek to live for you and follow you, our weaknesses often lead us into sin. Your forgiveness is so great. It's absolute, perfectly complete. So help us to rest in that as we ask you today to forgive us and renew us in your love. As we worship in this time together, each in our own place, would you be pleased to fill us with your Holy Spirit, that our worship may be heartfelt and genuine, free from distraction, and filled with the peace and joy that comes from knowing we're in your presence and that you're working in our lives. May our worship, O oh God, be acceptable to you, and may you find delight in us as we lift our hearts to you in praise this day. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. A song that's become a favourite here at St. Rollocks is Be Still for the Presence of the Lord is Moving in This Place. And it's a beautiful song that prepares us as we worship to be listening into God, but also encourages us to acknowledge his power and his grace that are at work even within us at this moment as we share in worship together. You'll see the words of the song coming on the screen so you're able to join in with it as we worship God together. Be still for the presence of the Lord. Still for the 
we're going to read today from Paul's letter to the church in Colossae. And if you have your Bible to hand, then you might like to look up chapter 3 of Paul's letter to the Colossians. And we're going to read from verse 12. So together, let's listen to God's word. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. And may God bless his word to us as we think together upon it and search it to see how it connects with our own lives and our own experience today. Piglet noticed that even though he had a very small heart, it could hold rather a large amount of gratitude. That's one of my favourite quotes from A.A. Milne, whose book uh, Winnie the Pooh and Friends has delighted and instructed many through the years. So let me ask you today, how big is your heart? Is it a heart that, like Piglet's, can hold rather a large amount of gratitude. One of the distinctive qualities of God's people is that they are thankful. And that's what I'd like to think about with you today as we look in particular just at verses 15 to 17 of what we read in Colossians chapter 3. Thankfulness. How is it that we can cultivate an attitude of thankfulness to God in our everyday lives as the church? How is it that we do that just now when the temptation, let's face it, is far more to moan and to lose patience about all that lockdown means than to be thankful and joyful about what we're experiencing? Well, Paul gives some guidance to the church in Colossae that might well help us. He basically tells the Christians there that thankfulness is all to do with your heart and what you do or don't allow to fill your heart. He tells us in verse 15 that the very first step to thankfulness is to let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. So take a moment and just think of what usually finds a place in your heart. What do you usually hold there? Is it the media overload just now and, and all the news about coronavirus? Or is it the worries and anxieties, the fears that you have for others? Is it the uncertainty that's surrounding your own employment, your status, or the latest letter from the home office, or just that kind of niggling cough that you've developed? What is it that finds a place in your heart just now? And only you, of course, know the answer to that question. And only you know if there's room in your heart for the peace of Christ. But if we're to be people of gratitude, then there needs to be more than just a little corner or a small chamber in your heart for that peace of Christ. It's not just to be squeezed in there when you remember in order to give you some nice, happy, fluffy feeling it's far more than that, and it deserves far more than just a tiny corner of your heart. Paul tells the followers of Jesus that as members of one body, they were called to peace. Peace was to be, if you like, a permanent resident in their midst. 
And if you think about it, of course, it's perfectly logical because of the peacemaking work that the Lord Jesus Christ carries out in our lives. Firstly, he brings us into relationship with God the Father by making peace between us. The sin that separated us from God, he removes and we find ourselves at peace with God. And then through that amazing change in our lives, Jesus brings us into a peace-creating community that he calls the church. Church which displays the lordship of Christ. And it's knowing this peace that brings thankfulness. It's a response to all that God has done for us in Christ. And in a way, Paul is perhaps pointing us to the fact that the Christian community should be a realm of peace because each one who's part of it is by nature committed to the rule of peace that has been brought into our lives by Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace. It's his peace that is to rule. His peace, if you like, is to act like an umpire or a referee. So just as when chaos breaks out on the football pitch and the referee intervenes and rules, much to the annoyance of the one who's ruled against, his role is to bring things back to order and to allow the match to proceed peacefully from there on in. So when chaos breaks out in the church, which it does from time to time, because we're human, it is the umpire of the peace of God that is to rule. And when there are difficult decisions to take, it's the peace of Christ that has to come into the midst and be the guide by which we make decisions. If we allow him his place to rule, then his intervention will always lead to thankfulness in our hearts. For when Christ rules in the heart, his peace will rule in the fellowship of God's people. So no matter the size of our heart, we're enabled to hold a large amount of gratitude there. Gratitude to the one who brokers peace and brings it right in to our midst so if that's the first step to thankfulness, Paul goes on to outline a second step. Second step to cultivating an attitude of thankfulness is to allow the word of God to dwell richly in us. He says that in verse 16, we are to be a people of the word, the word of Christ. So let's ask, what is that word of Christ? Is it the word of Christ in the scriptures? Is it the whole scriptures? We usually refer to them as the word of God. Or is Paul here really specifically referring to the teaching that Jesus Christ gave? That was the body of teaching familiar to him. He'd heard it and received it from the disciples who'd lived alongside Jesus. And he'd faithfully along with them retold that teaching. And they had recorded what Jesus said. Of course, it could be both of these things but it could also refer to something more. And when I reflect on this phrase, the teaching of Christ, or let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, I can't help but think about the beginning of John's gospel. The language is so similar. And there we're told that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And that the word came and made his dwelling amongst us. The word, of course, was Jesus Christ himself. So perhaps we can think that Paul is also thinking along the lines or saying to us or encouraging us to think that the word, Jesus himself, must dwell richly within us. Allow him to make his home in each one of us. The word, if you like, is to move into our lives and set up his home, his dwelling in us. The teaching of Christ and Christ himself are to be permanent residents, not infrequent visitors. They're not tenants who are renting time and space within us. They're there the whole time. 
And if we are Christians, then the amazing thing is that we are their home. We are the home of the Lord Jesus Christ and all that he teaches. And if we get that right, and then that all permeating quality of Jesus and his word truly enter into our DNA, then our own teaching and worship and all of our living is bound to be marked with heartfelt gratitude to God. For we have Christ in us. What an amazing and special and precious gift. It is interesting, though, to note in passing that it's not the word of God that is to rule. It's the peace of Christ that's to rule. The ruling factor in our lives as Christians and our lives together as a community of the church is that the peace of Christ is to rule. Could it be that we've more often than not reversed that order? Uh, and more often than not, we've allowed the word to rule and peace has sometimes been a casualty of that when it should have been the other way around. When peace, the peace of Christ should have ruled and the word dwelt richly. And when we get that round the wrong way, is that not also responsible in some way for diminishing our thankfulness and gratitude to God? We need to know that the peace of Christ is to have the final word. Peace is to be the referee rather than the word, if you like. So let the peace of Christ rule. But you must also let the word of Christ dwell richly. The third step that Paul outlines here to cultivating this attitude of thankfulness is in verse 17, where he says that whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And this is a great check and balance to make sure that our distinctiveness of Godward gratitude is maintained. If we're to speak and act in the name of Jesus, then we must be dependent on him, mustn't we? If we're to speak and act in the name of Jesus, then we need to know him, to know what he might say and what he might do. We need to be close to him and in a relationship with him, pausing before we speak and act to think, now, is this honoring the name of Jesus? Is what I'm about to say bringing honor to Jesus? We need to know what Jesus is like, don't we? Day by day, to know and to understand him more. As we do that, that gives us a purpose. The purpose being to, to live out our faith in word and deed in such a way that lifts Jesus up and not ourselves. And so all our teaching and evangelism, our praying, our caring, our organizing, our service to others, all of that needs to happen in such a way as to honor Jesus. And at the same time, Paul says, that needs to flow with thankfulness. The attitude in which we do it is to be one of thankfulness. Whatever you do, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Paul is really saying something quite big to the church in Colossae and by extension to all who follow Jesus. He's saying that thankfulness, it's not an afterthought. It's not something to tack on once everything else has been done. He's indicating that thankfulness is at the very heart and essence of the life of the church and that this spirit of thankfulness is the one in which we are to live out our faith and that's the attitude that's to mark our everyday practical Christian living. So where you've been a bit grumpy and frustrated this last week or so with life in general, where you've been moaning about what has been lost through lockdown, here comes a challenge to us as God's people to turn that around and to re-infuse our day with thankfulness, to refocus and to see the goodness of Jesus to us in the midst of our experience, even in these days of lockdown. 
So ask yourself, how big is your heart? And ask ourselves as a church, how big is our heart? Are we truly characterized by our thankful nature? That thankfulness that arises from Christ at the very center of all that we are and all that we do. That thankfulness that arises from his peace ruling and his word dwelling in us and his name clearly discernible in all our Christian living. That's a challenge to us, isn't it? But it's a challenge that may well lead those who know us to say, like it was said of Piglet, although you may have a small heart, it can hold a huge amount of gratitude. today we lift up to you the emerging crisis that is taking place in various parts of our world where there are refugee camps where people are living in such close proximity one to the other where there is no opportunity to social distance in an effort to avoid becoming ill with the coronavirus Father, we pray that your mercy would be poured out on people who are so vulnerable, who have already left and lost so much, that you would comfort, protect, but also move those who are in a position to help, to provide the aid that can change and relieve these situations. Thank you that you are the God who is near, in particular to those who grieve at this time, to those who have lost loved ones, to those who grieve in other ways, opportunities that have been lost, relationships that have broken down, children hoped for who were never given. Father, we entrust those who grieve to you and believe that what you say in your word that you will comfort is true for them, even this day. Lord God, we thank you that you are a God who comes near to all who cry out to you. And we thank you that you hear each one of us as we cry out to you for the things that concern us in this world, in our own nation, in our families, and in our own lives. We thank you that you never leave us, but promise always to be with us. Pray, Father, that you would so work in our hearts and in our lives 
that you would make those of us who know you and others too to live lives of thankfulness and gratitude. Father, where our hearts have shrunk and become small, we pray that you would enlarge them so that they might indeed hold and rediscover a huge amount of gratitude for all that you are and all that you have done, for all that you have given, and for all that you will, in your grace, continue to give. And so we lift these, our prayers, to you this morning in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray, to pray together, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forevermore. Amen. Perhaps in this week that lies ahead, you would challenge yourself to make a mental list or perhaps even to, to write it down. But of three things each day that you are thankful for, one thing that you see as a gift from God, one thing that you see as a gift from others, and the third, whatever touches your heart and brings you joy in this week ahead. Let's live lives of thankfulness in this week that is gifted to us. We're going to close this short time of worship now as we again sing together. And it's a song that talks about the way in which God fills our heart with thankfulness because of the promises he's made to us, because of his presence with us. And I invite you to join with us as we sing this now together. As we walk with the Lord Jesus Christ day by day into this new week, may our lives be characterized with the joy and thankfulness that he gives to us. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be yours this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.